Welcome back to Free Speech Nation. Now we discuss rising divisions in Britain's fifth largest political party, the Green Party. Former deputy leader of the Greens, Shara Ali, was the party spokesperson for nine years until he was suddenly dropped after activists complained that his tweets about women's sex-based rights were transphobic. Party officials ruled that his decision to champion a highly controversial position in the trans rights debate is not compatible. Shara Ali joins me now in the studio. Welcome. So, for uh, a lot of the people that mm. wouldn't have heard of your story and exactly what happened, can you talk us through it? When, was the, when were the first signs that there was some contention about your views within the party? Well, I mean, I'm, I've been a member for 20 years and a spokesperson for nine of those mm. up until a few weeks ago. Yeah. And it was really during the 2020 leadership election. So we elect our leaders, you know, the membership elect the leaders. Yes. And I was just struck by the fact that some of our candidates found it excruciatingly difficult to answer a straight question on what is a woman. Yeah. So I chose to answer it straight. And I said it's a woman is commonly defined um, in a certain way, right, as biological sex based. Yes. And with certain chromosomes XX. And immediately I was assailed by allegations of transphobia. People started writing about it publicly. Mm. And I challenge all that. You know, I challenge that. We cannot describe women in those terms biologically. I mean, the Keir Starmers and Ed Davies have rabbit in the headlights mode. This you is something that, that this people are seeing again and again is when, when they are asked about... I mean, the, the last Labour Party conference was just overshadowed by these questions mm -hmm. about cervixes. And yes. things, when clearly, Labour politicians wanted to be talking about the real issues, the issues that matter to people. Um, so was this at the time when you were running for leadership? Yeah, 2020, mm -hmm. and then fast forward to 2021, there was another leadership contest and a couple of co-leaders resigned yes. uh, under the pretext of uh, rising transphobia in the party and my appointment uh, in 2021 as a spokesperson. So the long and the short of it is this, is that I believe in equalities for all. Yes. And I've been fighting for those throughout you know, my adult life. And it is not transphobic to be able to support and defend the rights of women in certain environments to have single or same-sex spaces. Yes. Moreover, what I've always been arguing for is even more measured than that, arguably. It's simply to say that we need to have this debate. And in politics, it's very important that you negotiate people's rights and claims if they disagree. And yes. I don't know of a political environment until a few years ago now, it's becoming worse and worse and hostile, that you can't even speak to or address women's concerns, or that you'll be described as transphobic, even for agreeing to meet with them to understand those concerns. So I would say that what's at stake here, and the reason for my court case, is that we must defend the rights of politicians in all political parties. Rosie Duffield's of this world and the JK Rowling have been getting in the neck as well. We must defend the right for all of us to be able to speak freely on matters that concern us, even without adjudicating what is the right position to have. So you're taking the Greens to court over this? Yes, for, 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 with a heavy heart. For removing you mm -hmm. as a spokesperson on this basis. And there is something about the language they're using. Uh, they're talking about that any, anyone who has signed the, the Women's International Declaration about, same, about um, single sex spaces and women's rights should be kicked out of the party, essentially. But they're using very uh, militant terms. They're effectively doing exactly what you've just described, saying that these people are hateful, transphobic. I mean, and that insinuation has obviously made, been made at you. How does that feel to be accused well, I of think, these things? Yeah, I mean, firstly, to be... I mean, one of the strengths of the party is that any member can put a motion to conference. And the, the motion that you've described, which would have it that any member who has previously, it's retrospective as well, yeah. anybody who has previously signed, any member who's previously signed that declaration will be expelled from the party as a stroke. That's not yet Green Party policy, but it's coming before our conference next week. In right. Fact. So, yes, this is, I'm, I'm sorry, but this is authoritarianism. And, you know, people often talk about the left and the right. It's indistinguishable now in terms of authoritarianism because that can come from any direction. And, and that's going to really upset a lot, uh, a lot of um, long-standing Green supporters, isn't it? Because surely... The party was ostensibly about tolerance and about uh, the open discussion of views and the marketplace of ideas and, and, not, and, and standing up against bigotry. But the very definition of bigotry is that you just simply will not allow other people to have a viewpoint or to even express it. I think, I mean, there are multiple in, on, a, on, a, on a show called Free Speech. I think you must appreciate how much utility and value there is in being able to speak freely, mm. not just in terms of a contestation of ideas, because what it suggests, if you were to say that you and I are infallible. That's what the implication is. We can never be wrong about anything. Yes. But I'm frequently mistaken about things, and I only 
get to know that when I'm either challenged by people who disagree with me or I can actually fix my mistakes because I haven't heard it from the people who have most interest in it. So where does this come from, though? Because there's an, in, uh, there's an implication in what the, the Greens are saying is that this is a settled matter. Well, you know, they're, they're talking as, as though there is no discussion to be had here. But the whole point is there hasn't been a discussion. People haven't been allowed to have the discussion because whenever they raise the point, Indeed, they yeah. get slammed down. I mean, the thing is, if you look at... The UK, I would say, is pretty much at the forefront of this debate for the right reason, because our judiciary is protecting our rights. Uh, the Maya Forster case, for example, was instrumental in demonstrating that something as plain as sex is immutable yeah. is a protected belief. You cannot be discriminated against on the basis of holding or adhering to that belief. And I would say that that belief and that assertion is thoroughly consistent with my own party's party policies. And it's the idea and the notion when you conflate sex and gender that it isn't, that's where the problem comes from. And you can only overcome that if you have clarity of thought. I call myself first and foremost a, a rational apostate, if you like, yes. because I'm challenging these ideas um, you know, at face value, and I want to be able to do that. But a lot of people will be watching this and thinking to themselves, but the, the, the idea that there are biological differences between men and women isn't a belief, surely. That's just a scientific fact, isn't it? So it, yeah, why is that with controversial? You. It's a belief which relates to a fact of the world. Yes, but they're it saying the, the, is, yeah. the implication here is that even to state the fact that we all know is, is to enter into, wade into controversial I th territory. I think you're right, because beliefs can be more or less true, and so it, yes. why even raise it as an open question that it's a belief which could be false? Yes. I think that's fair enough, but in legalese, we refer to it as a protected belief. But I would say I will go further in some areas, and nobody has been able to... Sh this is actually one of the problems with my removal as a spokesperson. Yes. The evidence hasn't been produced, and I think that should tell you something, because mm. I've managed to successfully fight off um, allegations of transphobia in the past, because I've defined transphobia, and I've looked at the evidence, and I've done a rebuttal. But in this case, the absence of evidence is evidence of absence. I haven't actually done anything yes. transphobic, even according to our own rules. So and it's almost as though the allegation is in of itself sufficient to see you punished? Or is that what people believe? That's in itself authoritarian. And yes. so we must see the evidence. But ultimately, there are areas where I will be quite firm on the right of women to have their own dignity. Hmm. So we have a Scottish MSP who a couple of years ago resigned from Scottish Green Party, actually, because he was felt forced and bullied into not being able to vote for an amendment which would simply have done this. It would have guaranteed the right of a woman who had been the victim of a sexual crime, like a rape, to choose the sex of her medical examiner. And apparently, that amendment was transphobic. And I, I think he couldn't live with himself because although he voted against his conscience, he thought, well, what am I doing in this business? Yeah. So... I would say I'm a bit more defiant than that, although I admire um, his position. I think that we have to take a stand against this kind of authoritarianism. It is the case, as a matter of basic human dignity, that women should have the right to choose the sex of their examiner, and it's not transphobic to say so. And it's not just a problem with the Greens, is it? Because, I mean, we've seen that this, these issues are tearing the SNP apart, as we mentioned earlier about the Labour Party as well. Mm. It, what strikes me about all of this, and what I find interesting is, can they not see that this is electoral hemlock? You know, people, the, the voters are looking at this and yes. thinking, what are you doing to yourselves? Well, that's the other remarkable thing about it, because um, a politician or a leader of a political party who cannot define in commonsensical terms uh, what a woman is, I, I think that's not a credible party. That's not a credible belief system. Yeah. Um, because it, it affects every part of our world. I mean, we're we thinking about, uh, for example, the war in um, Ukraine. It's women and children and men who are staying fighting. That's based on a biological sex category. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going into the minutiae of gender identity. So these are basic biological categories, which then there's a reason for them. Yes. And that isn't to say that we aren't going to defend the right of people who identify according to gender identity sure. lines. We will, but they're two separate categories. And that's exactly the point, is that the, the accusation of transphobia is is so wrong-headed because mm -hmm. you're not at any point saying you're not going to support trans people's rights or equal rights for trans people or people who identify as other genders. That's, that's I there. will, and I do, but the courts even last year also, when they were looking at the judicial review of prisons policy, so there's quite a lot of consternation amongst female inmates, for example, about having their single-sex or same-sex um, prison estate.
Yes. And, you know, that is a legitimate question. Yes. Because if you have a, a male sex offender who identifies as a woman and ends up offending in the f female prison estate... As has happened. That, yes. I would say something's gone wrong there in terms of your risk assessment. So it's a legitimate question to have. And the Judicial Review also found that there is a conflict of rights of sorts. So that needs resolving. And, sorry, to answer your earlier question, this is not a vote winner, neither in terms of being credible in terms of politicians being able to call a thing by its proper name, yes. and, moreover, because we are alienating vast sections, potentially 51% of the population, men and women, who cannot withstand this kind of um, erosion of their sex-based, mm. especially women's, rights. And also, the, you know, the, the, an assault on the truth, just not being able to speak the truth or to have the discussion. You know, that's the thing. Where do you hope, ultimately, I'm, I'm, yes. we are running out of time, but of course. Where, where do you hope, ultimately, that the legal challenge will, will lead? What, can, what, what good can come of this? What will it produce? Well, you know, unfortunately, <laughs> we need to be able to set a, a legal marker mm. uh, for two reasons, really. It's to say that this level of hostility and oppression towards politicians or human individuals who want to be able to speak their mind clearly and rationally must not be allowed to continue. And, moreover, we, we can protect women's female spaces, but we need to have a negotiation with those who feel that their claims are also... Yes. ...have to be negotiated. But, but, but do you think there's a risk? Because um, a lot of people are intimidated into mm -hmm. silence and they see what's happened to you... Yes. And they'll look at that and think, well, I'm just not going to get involved in this discussion. I don't want, you know, I just want to steer clear. That's, that's actually, that's ultimately how um, this erosion happens. The erosion of free speech is the most negatively consequential thing we can allow in our body politic. Yes. It is so detrimental to everything that we do. Because in order to make good policy, and you see it sometimes in the House of Commons and the House of Lords, you have people debating ideas in order to arrive at a robust policy. Once you lose that capacity to speak freely, you know, without being persecuted for actually betraying what you actually think, once you lose that capacity, we're, we're no longer a democratic society as far as I'm concerned. So that's why I'm defending. I'm defending the right for people to be able to articulate what are ultimately rationally justified, justifiable positions. And I'm saying that we are not going to... We must lay down a legal marker, this kind of harassment and discrimination based on people's legally protected beliefs, which is now proven after the Forster ruling, will not be allowed to continue. And that will benefit all politicians in all political parties. Charlie, thank you very much for thank joining you. me.